Welcome to another episode of Diaspora Link here exclusively on GhanaWeb.com. My name is Diallo Sumbri and I'm your host. This episode, I have a wonderful opportunity to talk to a dear friend, somebody who's my friend, my colleague, my partner, my homie, and my teacher. And I'm really, really excited to share her, her a little bit about her story and the work that she does with her company with you. Her name is Dr. Ashley Milton. Let's get into today's show. Before we get into our interview with our guest today, we like to play this small little game where we find out about some of their choices. So this is the way this works. I'm going to give our guest, Dr. Ashley Milton, some choices, and then she has to choose one only and tell us why. Dr. Milton, one only and tell us why, okay? Are you ready? Now, because I know, you know I got some tough questions, so, and you cannot choose one that's not an option. You have to choose one. All my guests are so difficult. You guys don't want to make these choices. I wasn't ready. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right, here's the first one. You have to choose one. Okay. And you got to tell me why. Okay. Senegal versus Ghana. Whew. Everybody's still going to love you, I promise you. It be Ghana we day. <laughs> Ghana we day. Ghana we day. Why? Oh, gosh. Ghana. Whew. The easiest language barrier. Okay, language barrier. Language Simple. barrier. Got you. Yes. Simple. All right. L.A. versus Tallahassee. Oh my gosh, that's really hard. <laughs> choose one. Um, okay, and tell me why. I think if I could, it's October. It's homecoming season. I'm gonna choose Tallahassee. Tallahassee. I'm gonna choose FAMU. Yes. Why? Because it's the yard. Because of the yard. It's because of the yard. Yes. Because the FAMU yard. It's because of the yard. It's because of the Rattlers. HBCU experience. It's because of the exposure, the experience, the people. Just it's like just this melting plot of, of blackness. Like okay. Everything. I got another one for you. Okay. Hip hop versus reggae music. Hip hop. Hip hop. Why? It's what I grew up on. It's what you grew up on. Yeah. It's a part of who you are. It's part of my, it's part of my DNA. All right. I got Hashtag another, I, Kendrick Lamar. I got another one for you. Yasa du Poulet versus Contumere. Mm -mm, Yasa. Yasa Poulet. Yasa Poulet all day. Yasa Poulet. Yasa Poulet all day. Yasa Poulet. Shakje. Yasa Poulet. Shakje. Every day. Shakje. Every, Every day. day. Every, Every day. day. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, one more. Okay. Hmm. Half and half, lemonade iced tea versus Sobolo and ginger. So Arnold Palmer versus Sobolo and BSAP or Sobolo ginger. Like right. Well, B so B Sobolo and BSAP is the same. Yeah. But so BSAP versus Arnold Palmer. Same thing. Yeah. Which one? BSAP. BSAP all day. Yeah, but Sobolo all but day. I specifically, I said Sobolo with ginger. So the mix of the two. When we make BSAP in Senegal, it automatically, it has, automatically has, the ginger. has ginger. Okay. So I don't really so know. So Arnold Palmer without. versus BSAP. B set. B set. Over, Ar over Arnold Palmer? Yeah. Over 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 a Tallahassee yes. lemonade yes, iced tea that's, mix? That's diabetes in a cup. <laughs> 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 I just wanted the sober low and the ginger. Exactly. I got you. The whole point of this is just to remind us that every day we all make different choices and that we're not always going to make the same choice, and that's okay. Our choices and our differences shouldn't divide us, but they should bring us closer together. Now, the next thing that we're going to do, this is something that we do called top five. I'm going to give Dr. Milton five categories, and I'm going to ask her her top choice in each category. All right? Dr. Milton, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Books. Give us your favorite book, and if you can, give us your favorite book, the first book that comes to your mind and why. Um, <clears throat> Leopold's Ghost. Leopold's Ghost. Okay. By Adam... Hawk's Child. Okay. And why? This was the primary text that was almost the foundation of my doctoral dissertation. Okay. And top book or top books? Top book. Just top one. Top book. Yes. So Leopold's Ghost. Leopold's Ghost. That's it. Okay. All right. Next, um, tell me your favorite sport and why. Oh. Ooh. Um... I would say volleyball. 
Volleyball. Did yes, you play volleyball? I did. Okay. Um, it's fun. I think it's different than basketball, different than track. It's just, uh, I feel like you can just go out and just do it and just have a really good time. Um, yeah, I really like volleyball. Volleyball. Okay. Yes. Your favorite food, period. Shock jour. <laughs> if you had to choose one food. Like cuisine. Cuisine. Japanese. Japanese cuisine. Japanese. Over everything. It would be Asian, actually. I would Asian. choose Asian. Asian. Yes. Because okay. Asian is the gamut. Indian, Japanese, Malaysian, Vietnamese. Okay. All, all right. of that. Favorite musical artist of all time? Just one. Jeez. Yeah, that's really difficult. Just pick one. Um, dang, right now I'm really feeling Drake. Drake of all time? No, no, I mean, you said like, it's, I don't have a lot of time, right? I'm just thinking. I know, but just that, I'm just, if, if you only had to choose one right now, which okay, is fine. Okay, okay, okay. No, no let's choose Drake. Okay, that's my guy Drake, too. that's hip hop, but if we're going to really do it, I'm going to do Coltrane, you know. Coltrane, yeah. okay. I'm I'm Coltrane. Across all genres. Across, everything. yeah. If we're going to okay. do across all genres, I could just listen, you know, Coltrane, but, jazz. But, but. Hip hop, but, but but Drake, Drake. is Drake is hot. He's killing he, it. Yeah, He's Drake, it right and now. then also Burner though. Okay, Drake and Burner. Okay, yeah. all right, all right, all right. Yeah, all you don't right. have to get those in. Last there. one <laughs> is your favorite place to vacation. If you had to choose one place in the world where you could that be, I've already been or that I want to go, either that you've already been or you want to go. Your favorite, so just one place where you can just go and be. My permanent vacation place is Turks and Caicos. Turks and Caicos. Turks all day. Okay. Have you been there already? All all the time. And if it okay. wasn't COVID, that's what's keeping me from being there right now. Got you. Yes. But one place that I always, always, my spirit will always take me is Mombasa, Kenya. So which one? Turks and Caicos No, or Turks Mombasa? and Caicos is there. It's always. Gotcha. Turks and Caicos. Yes, yes, okay. yes. All right. But my forever place. Mombasa. Forever, ever, ever, ever. Forever, ever? Ever, ever. Ever, ever? Mombasa. Mombasa. Yes. Okay. So we found out about Dr. Milton's top five. Now let's get into the interview to find out who she is, where she's from, and what she's doing. Great day. And we are back with another wonderful episode of Diaspora Link, as I've said. And I'm here with today's guest that, as I told you, I'm so excited to talk to. Dr. Ashley Milton is in the building. Everybody knows how excited I am to have this conversation with you. But before we really get into the conversation, let me just let the listening audience know that we did not plan our outfits. <laughs> Sometimes synchronicity is just synchronized. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that's how we getting down. So, Dr. Ashley Milton, let's start off. Where are you from originally? Originally, I'm from Africa. Uh, okay, originally. Okay, see how we getting into this? <laughs> originally, you from Africa. Where were you born? That's the better question. Okay. I was born in Los Angeles, California. Los Angeles, California. L.A. L.A. South Central. South Central. 42nd in Arlington. 42nd in Arlington. Okay, so from L.A., you went to where? So I graduated high school in the Bay Area. Okay. And what high school? Shout out your high school. Vanden. Vanden High Fairfield, School. Fairfield, California. Shout out. Shout out Vanden, Fairfield, California. Okay. <laughs> and then I moved to Tallahassee, Florida. You moved to Tallahassee, Florida. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Let's see. What was the purpose for moving to Tallahassee, Florida? Well, you see, there's this very... Very, very amazing school on the highest of seven hills in Tallahassee called Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, okay. also known as FAMU. FAMU, exactly. shout out. Shout out FAMU, founded on October 3rd, 1887. Yes, yeah, so in 2021, we celebrated our 134th year as an institution. As a shout out to FAMU, shout out to all HBCUs. Shout out to I, all HBCUs. I know you got love for HBCUs. I do. So they don't know this, but I'm trying to... I'm kind of trying to rush you through this early part of your life, and I'm kind of trying to rush you through how you got to where you are so we could talk about where you are, okay. right? Because that's what, that's what, why I'm so excited. But we can't rush too much. So you are Dr. Ashley Milton. So I know that you went to FAMU. Yes. I know that you went to American University, yes. right, for in your Washington, master's degree in Washington, D.C. for public policy. Yes. And I also know that you got your Ph.D. from George Mason. Correct? Yes. Okay. I, I did a little research. You did a little bit. I did a little research. Okay. So let's talk about what brought you to Africa. Tell me, when was your first time in Africa? My first time in Africa was in 2009. 2009. And what exactly. brought you to the continent? 
I was brought here to do work in healthcare, okay, public health, looking at children's rights, and that was in Senegal. Okay, so Senegal was your first country. Senegal was my first birthright experience. Wow, guess what? Senegal was my first country on the continent. Can That's you do that up. one more time? Hey. Ah, ah, ah. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. All right, so now what other, just what other countries have you visited on, on the continent? Mm, you've been to, you've been. I've been to quite a few countries. So let's okay. just say I have transversed West Africa, East Africa, Central Africa, and have yet to fully dive into Southern Africa. Okay, so right now we're going to take a pause for the calls and play Africa in 60. So this should be fun since Dr. Milton has transversed the African continent and she just told us she's been to all sides. So this is what we do. Africa in 60 is very simple. Okay. Name as many African countries as you can in 60 seconds. Okay? okay. So I see I see you ready. Hey look, fam, you watching. So what you gonna do? Do we have our timer set? Timer is set. Can we get a countdown? Five, four, three, two, one, let's go. Mauritania. Morocco, Senegal, Gambia, Sierra Leone, Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, Ghana, Togo, Benin, Nigeria, Mali, Chad, Western Sahara, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, Eritrea, South Africa, Lesotho, Botswana, Namibia, Gabon, Cameroon, Chad, Democratic Republic of Congo, the Republic of Congo, Sudan, South Sudan, Algiers, Lesotho. You said that one already. Um, Mozambique, say you know, I say shows Cabo Verde, Sao Tome, Madagascar, Rwanda. Burundi. Cut. Ooh, that was 35. Well, you was going. That's what's up. So, y'all know we like to play Africa in 60. And the reason why we play Africa in 60 is because we want people to know that Africa is a continent, that there are 54 countries, that it's not a monolithic place, and that there are so many different diverse languages, cultures, traditions that are here. So, Ashley, great job Thank with you. Africa in 60. Okay, so now let's jump back into it. So, Senegal. Yes. So, and you said you've been to... Different countries. Okay, so what, what took you around the continent of Africa? So, what first brought me here was my just immense interest to, to be in Africa. Okay. Um, and I didn't get that opportunity when I was studying at FAMU. Okay. So, the first opportunity I had, I took it. Um, and it wasn't necessarily in my subject matter expertise, but it was in my general interest. Okay. So, what has continued to bring me here um, outside of that first experience, I have worked for the U.S. government. Okay. So, I've worked for USAID. Mm -hmm. I have also worked for the State Department. I have been brought back to Africa as a Fulbright Scholar. So okay. I nice. did. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I did my uh, Fulbright research in the DRC in the middle of the forest. So my work has been um, working for U.S. government in that capacity, working for private sector, doing research, and then what has brought me back now and what continues to keep me here is my business. Okay. You know what? I don't even have to do a segue. <laughs> Perfect segue. Tell us about your business, She Grows It. So She Grows It, um, SGI for short, okay. is a company of the future. We consider ourselves to be a lifestyle uh, organization, right? Okay. So our business, we use big data analytics to inform on decision making for ourselves and for our clients. And that can look like making decisions on public health to infrastructure development. Mm -hmm. And we are really excited to be where we are in the market because we are situated at the environmental science and technical interface, right? Environmental science and policy interface. Okay. So what that means is that as we transition out of capitalism mm -hmm. and into a new economic system, hopefully. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. It's a little bit more you, equitable. You, you, hold on, you use a lot of big words. Who said we're transitioning out of capitalism? I think it's clear with COVID okay. that we are moving into a new economic system okay. that 
has to be more inclusive, right? Okay. So when we think about the toilet paper or the hand sanitizer scenarios in the beginning of COVID, um, everyone has to have access for mm -hmm. everyone to mm -hmm. be safe. Right. So right now our economic system is highly extractive and very exclusive. Okay. So now that we are been in our homes for the last two years, we see now that there has to be change. So we're definitely moving into a new system. Okay. So SGI is situated at this interface where all new businesses that are coming up are gonna have to come through our processes. And what that means is that when you are looking for capital, right, mm -hmm. looking for financial resource, um, you're not just gonna be able to show traditional forms of credibility. Okay. You're gonna have to show environmental and social governance standards. Okay. Right, so all new businesses are gonna have to show that to get access to what we're calling as green capital or green securities. Okay. And all existing businesses are gonna have to eventually stop and come back gotcha. and show that as well. Now, so. now, where else or who else is having these discussions right in the world about moving out of capitalism about being able to show a different kind of receipts and credibility or is this something that SGI is is groundbreaking <laughs> in, into the industry so people are having the conversation and okay. I don't want to say that we are groundbreaking gr groundbreaking the industry because I think that when we change language, we often shift baselines. Okay. So for example, gentrification. Right. Gentrification in the original scientific concept of ecology is ecosystem stress. So when you stress an ecosystem by removing the native species that are there mm -hmm. and you replace it with invasive, mm -hmm. you have retrogression, right? The system okay. doesn't look the same. Right. Right. We see it in DC. Right. Uh, we're seeing it in parts of Accra. Right. So I don't want to say that we are innovative or innovating a, a new uh, method okay. or a new economic system, but I will say that we are innovating the conversations that need to be had so that we can progress as a collective people. When I say we, I mean black people. I was, I was going to ask, who's black we? People. Is we everybody? We, I mean, <laughs> we, as, we as black people. I think that I want to say where we stand is that we want to serve all aspects of the bell curve. Okay. So if we serve the most marginal end of the bell curve, then okay. we're serving the entire bell curve, right? Understood. So the most marginal end is, is black. Is black right? people. Mm -hmm. And black being African, African being black. And because anti-blackness is global, we need someone in our corner. Okay. So when I say us, I'm, I'm thinking about who is innovating or leading on progressive solutions that allow us to live and thrive in place right. today, right? right? Not mm -hmm. hundreds of years mm -hmm. from now, but today. So. so this is Diaspora Link and our focus is on, the, is on the diaspora. Talk to me a little bit about SGI's work when it comes to the continent of Africa mm -hmm. and its relationship with its diaspora. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting question. So SGI's work or just the continent of Africa with its relationship with the diaspora? Well, well, let's start with your ideas, opinions about the continent of Africa mm -hmm. and its relationship with the diaspora. Let's start there and then let's move to SGI's work with regards to the continent of Africa and it's diaspora. Okay. So I, the and I keep saying the continent of Africa and it's diaspora because I want to be clear we're talking about black people, African people. Yes. Okay. So, one, the continent of Africa is beautiful. Extremely. Um, <laughs> gosh, it's so beautiful. I mean, then these neon colors that I thought only truly existed in like the Crayola box. Right. No. All like, over. All over, like butterflies and in the middle of the forest and under the water. It's just mm -hmm. amazing. So Africa is, is amazing. It's an amazing continent. It's, it's wealthy. It's rich with resources and people and climates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I believe that the relationship that Africa has with its diaspora, particularly the diaspora that descends from enslaved Africans, okay. is estranged. Okay. Um, and Talk about that estrangement really quickly I just I mean I mean so I think we understand a little bit of what that estrangement is when we start talking about being the descendants of an enslaved people when we start talking about the transatlantic slave trade and, we, and when we talk about what that small part of African history 
has done to us as a people, mm -hmm. right? But just talk a little bit about like that estrangement on 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 a Dr. Ashley Milton level, <laughs> because I know I love the way you connect the ecosystem, the economy, social. So you know, I'm trying to I'm digging. Uh, I mean, I think that without having interest in your lost connections, right? Okay. This is like mm -hmm. a Sankofa. Okay. Without having interest in your lost connections, it's really hard to chart a path forward in the future. So Ghana has been independent for 64 years. Yes. Infancy in the scheme of democratic countries operating in a capitalistic system, right? A democratic capitalism right. system, political system. So um, the relationship with, or the lack of relationship with all of the diaspora. So I'm, I'm sure that Ghana has a connection to its Ghanaian citizens that live mm -hmm. in the US mm -hmm. or that live in the UK. Um, but it's the connection with Africans that don't have the privilege of saying, oh, I know that I'm Ghanaian. Um, and that is problematic because without that connection, we can't truly understand how to create pathways for our own growth, right? Growth beyond aid. So mm -hmm. I think that there has to be truly just more interest interest beyond i was having a conversation on both sides oh yes on both sides but okay. i also think that it has to be it's hard for it's hard on both sides right? right but i definitely think that we were taken mm -hmm. and we were taken in such a, a violent manner mm -hmm. that and it was intentional that we, we couldn't find our way back. Right. So I think for the assumption to be that we have to, or that the African American has to find it, which, which a lot of us are finding our way back, right. it's just very difficult without there being, it would be a lot more easier if there were like reaching of arms and okay. interest to help us. Um, and I don't feel that, that there's interest in helping us to come back. Or not enough interest. Or interest when we're here, that's relevant. Okay, we're going to... Yeah. Listen, we are in class with Dr. Ashley Milton here on Diaspora Link. We're going to take a small break, and we'll be right back. Peace, Global African Family. My name is Diallo Sumbri. I'm a co-architect of Ghana's Year of Return 2019, and I'm the president and CEO of the Adinkra Group. For the past five years, we've been bringing loads and loads of people to Ghana. Many of them, their first time on the African continent. Their first time putting their toes in the African sand, in the African soil. And so many people have had their life changed. Our birthright journeys are curated cultural immersion journeys centered around reclaiming cultural identity, exploring your ancestral heritage, and celebrating African resilience. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our Birthright Journey Partner Program. It's really simple, and you really don't have to do much other than email us at info at theadinkragroup.com. Now, what makes a great Birthright Journey Partner for our program? Are you a leader? Are you an influencer? Are you that person that your family calls on to organize, or do you automatically know that that's your job? Are you somebody of status in your community? Are you a community leader? Are you that person in your church or in the school? If you are, you are the ideal birthright journey partner. Do you believe that every person of African descent should have an opportunity to touch ground on the continent of Africa? If you are, then you are the ideal birthright journey partner. It's simple. We're gonna show you how you can travel to Ghana for free. Not only can you travel to Ghana for free, but you can actually get paid to travel to Ghana. Really simple. Just contact us at info at and set up a discovery call. You'll get to travel. You'll get to travel with your family and friends. You'll get to travel with your community. And the best part of it is that it'll be free for you. Or you'll even earn money doing it. So again, info at theadinkergroup.com. We look forward to seeing you in Ghana. We look forward to dancing with you in Ghana. We look forward to eating fufu, eating jollof, eating wache. Uh -huh. Make sure you contact us now, and we would love for you to become a Birthright Journey partner. Madasi.
great deeds. We are back. Diaspora Link in class with Dr. Ashley Milton. Dr. Milton. What up? Oh, I'm in love this conversation. <laughs> All right, so um, we talked about your ideas around Ghana, and I'm just going to use Ghana as an example for African countries reaching out, right? Mm -hmm. Reaching out to not only invite us, but truly welcome us. And when we arrive, having a streamlined program set up for us, not program, but, you know, having having something set up to help our transition be a little bit easier, mm -hmm. right? So give me your opinion of the year of return and do you think it did that? So in some, you know, go ahead. So I think that like for me, my experience in Africa is that I've, my career has been spent on the continent, right? right. So working bicontinentally, bilaterally between DC and Africa. Hold on. I, I kind of skipped over that part a little bit because I was so pressed to get into this conversation. But just tell us how long you've been on the continent. We talked about the fact that your first time was in 2009 mm -hmm. and that you worked around. But just let's just take a small step back and just tell us how long you've been working on the continent and like and where you've been working really quickly. So, I mean, it's been over a decade of visiting, vacationing, living, working and investing on this continent. OK, so perfect. Let's let's dive back in. Yes. All right. So the remind me now. Year of return. Year of return. Um, I think year of return was great. Mm -hmm. Right. We always need a homecoming. We need that visit. And I think year of return sparked that visit. Okay. I think it's important that we classify things as what they are because words mean things. Right. OK. So I think that the year of return opened up the doors. Right. For diaspora to return. Mm -hmm. um, for that visit, for that experience, for that exposure um, to kind of propel that next engagement, to propel what the education might look like or the re-education um, or understanding how things you may have been miseducated. Mm -hmm. So I think that the year of return was a great experience. I, I don't believe that the year of return set up any specific trajectory for African Americans. I think there were a lot of African Americans or diaspora that are returning. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. there were a lot of robust conversations that were being had. Diaspora drives um, during 19, mm -hmm. there were a lot of great conversations that were um, discussed at that event. I believe that there has to be more conversations, and this comes brings me back to interest. Mm -hmm. I believe that there needs to be more conversations um, from the true perspective of the African American that's returning, because okay. a lot of African Americans. What, what do you mean by true perspective? Um, I believe a lot of the conversations around diaspora returning have to be disaggregated. Okay. Now, my people hate when I use that word. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, Ashley, this is too academic. Right. Um, no, you, but it's you, you have to break it out, right? Mm -hmm. And I think when you say diaspora that's returning, you can't. We have to separate Ghanaian, British Ghanaians. We have to separate uh, Ghanaian Americans mm -hmm. from African Americans. And what about Caribbean Amer uh, uh, Caribbean people well, who are I, from the Caribbean, or? So I think when we say return, right? Um, I think that the. The conversation is, is speaking to me when it's saying year of return. Oh, gotcha. um, and I, I, I say that specifically because a Ghanaian who's living abroad is right. a choice is a choice migrant. Gotcha. Right. Mm -hmm. And they know that they're Ghanaian. So they know that they, but, they but, have a no they right. have a no a knowledge but about this place. For those of us who've had yeah, that, that, that has been our identity taken. Yeah. So that we have to have real conversations with those people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. about what it takes to facilitate their capability to return. Mm -hmm. um, because without those conversations, it is very hard, right? So I've had my career on the continent. Mm -hmm. I've been brought over where the US government has paid for my housing. I've started at my own, many of African apartments, mm -hmm. fully furnishing like fixtures, tiles. I think that it's when I look at African Americans that are living here that have returned or that are trying to return, mm -hmm. they're not, they, they lack something that's really critical to their ability to provide to the economy progressive, like economic growth solutions. What are they lacking? They lack stability. Okay. 
they, they, we're lacking of stability. It's really difficult. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to come. First of all, it's just difficult, right? Let's acknowledge right, that right, right. we've been out fighting a war. Right. It's been, <laughs> can I cuss? No. Okay, yeah. No. So, right, right. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we've been out, right? It's like the Matrix. If you can imagine, like, right. the Matrix, and you're going through these different realms, uh -huh. and then you finally make it back home, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then your house is more messed up than the war zone that you left. Wow. Wow. And That's a great analogy. You, you arrive and you land and you're here. Like, I'm here by myself, right? Um, mm -hmm. My family came to visit, but I don't show up to a house, even if it's not in the bubble, right? In the ring road area, even if it's in Donsel Men or mm -hmm. Adenta, mm -hmm. I don't show up to a house. Mm -hmm. I don't show up to a car. You don't show up to land? I don't, or just even a, just even a plot of <laughs> land where I could just start building, right? right? I have to come in and there's so many costs. And I think that, as an African-American, we don't realize that when you're here mm -hmm. and you're living, like, it's a different type of wealth. Like, mm -hmm. we have more liquidity, but here the wealth is, is access. It's like everything is paid for. Right. Right, whereas we're paying for things there. So it's just very different. You have to pay mm -hmm. for everything up front. Yep. Um, so it just makes it really hard to transition. And so I think that in order for us to truly get to the next step of repatriation, mm -hmm. not just visits, not just vacations, but right. actually people who are coming to live, mm -hmm. right? Coming with their special skills, right? right? Subject matter expertise that are needed in this mm -hmm. economy mm -hmm. to grow, grow our businesses mm -hmm. so that we actually own our sectors. And I'm going really, really fast no, here. No, 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 that's fine. But it's really important that we open up pathways to citizenship for African-Americans. Okay, let's stop right there. Cause that, you know what? <laughs> Stay out my notes because I think you all in my notes. Because I was about to say, you know what? Because I know that SGI has done some work around this. So I really want you to talk about SGI's work around pathways to citizenship for descendants of enslaved Africans, right? Mm -hmm. And what, and just give us an idea of how you've been able to calculate the impact that the diaspora could have on the African continent and how that works. So I think it's important to first, before we even talk about pathways into okay. citizenship and why that's important, I think we first have to talk about our countries, right? Okay. So Ghana Beyond Aid is mm -hmm. a really big uh, presidential policy push, mm -hmm. just like your return, 1D, 1F. So in order for us to help Ghana, Ghana grow beyond aid. When um, you say us, you're talking about the diaspora? Us, black people. Us, black people. In right. And okay. so when we, and then we're talking about Ghana. So we're not talking about all black people. We're talking about people who are interested in Ghana because mm -hmm. clearly we're here. Um, we have to understand what that means, right? So there's public sector and private sector. Right. Public sector has put the mandate out that we must grow beyond aid. Which okay. is very important. So that is a mandate to the private sector that the private sector must rise to the occasion in order to facilitate the necessary governmental growth to get us beyond aid. Okay. What that means is that the government has to be able to mobilize revenue internally. We cannot always go outside the country mm -hmm. to mobilize FDI, foreign direct investment. Right. So in order for us to grow beyond aid, that means mm -hmm. we have to own our private sectors. Okay. There's 11 of them, 11 mm -hmm. sectors, right? Uh, how many of them do you believe that Ghana owns? I would hope at least half. I would hope so, right? We would hope so. <laughs> so where we are now, before we again connect to Pathways to Citizenship, mm -hmm. is that we have to truly understand where we sit in our private sector. Okay. So in order to understand how many sectors we own, sectors are made up of industries, right. 72 of them. Okay. In order to understand how many industries we own, we need to understand the businesses. There's okay. 215 types of businesses. So of those, how many of them exist in Ghana? Mm -hmm. How many of them are employing Ghanaians? Okay. How many of them have middle management that's Ghanaians? Okay. Upper management that are Ghanaians, right? And I I'm think we're getting ownership and as then well. ownership that okay. are Ghanaians. I think okay. that the the more we go up that train, we see less and less and less and less and less. Okay. So what SGI is pushing is pathways to formalization. Okay. We want to close the gap between the informal and formal divide. Okay. 95% of the businesses in Ghana are informal. And, and what makes those businesses informal? Informal means that they are not either registered, they are not tax compliant, which okay. is critical, right? So you could be registered and be a great profitable business, but if you're not compliant with your taxes, you're not formal. 
Okay. Formality means that you are checking all of the boxes of legality, mm -hmm. all of the boxes of fiscal accountability, okay. so that the transparency of your transactions are clear. Okay. Right? That allows for financial investment to, to come in. Mm -hmm. And then it also allows for you to pay your tax burden. Let, let, me, let me stop and just ask you, ask you a quick question. I've, I've been involved in this conversation before with some really smart people. I'm happy to know extremely smart people like you. I'm happy to know that I am not the brightest light bulb in the room in most of the rooms that I'm in. Some of this feels like a case before what comes first, the chicken or the egg, when you start talking about development and mm -hmm. inside the country. Because some people say, well, who wants to pay taxes? Mm -hmm. Who wants to be tax compliant mm -hmm. if the government is not going to give me the services that I'm supposed to get for my taxes? That's a great question. So, so, so is it like, so mm -hmm. like, that is, is, it almost feels like a never-ending battle, mm -hmm. right? So, so I'm assuming that as the government taxes, the government also, or the private industry, somebody has to also hold the government accountable. So things are happening at the same time. Let's just, so I, I think, don't want to take you too far. No, yeah, off, yeah, yeah. So I think that with Pathways of Formalization, um, we need formal enterprises operating in our private sector so that we can mobilize tax revenue. Okay. That doesn't mean immediate, right? Because taxing the poor is not always the best economic growth solution, right? Okay. So Pathways to Formalization is truly a two-prong approach, and it's a 10-year strategy, Okay. knowing that it takes 18 years to move an individual out of poverty and into a different economic class, Okay. right? So five years of saying, like, the most un or illiterate business, right? Mm -hmm. It's educational pathways. It's critical knowledge points, civics, right? Basic fiscal mm -hmm. accounting, um, technological understanding. Mm -hmm. These are critical and core components to operating good business, right? right? Good business standards. And once you have those, then it's also working with the government to say, okay, and we've done this before in DRC, mm -hmm. this, this business may understand their tax burden, but in year one, they're paying 25%. Right. In year two, mm -hmm. 50%, 75, such that after five years, they are able to be fully 100% compliant mm -hmm. and also maintain compliance. Okay. That's what's important. So it's not about pathways to formalization in order to tax. It's about pathways to formalization so that we have a more credible private sector. Right. And when you have a more credible private sector where the transaction transparency persists, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. then again, you can mobilize tax revenue. Right. And the government cannot provide services if they have no money. If they have no and money. it's important that the government is telling us in more ways than not, you know, mm -hmm. we. Mm -hmm this is where we are. We need to grow beyond aid. Right. So I think for all intents and purposes, they're saying, hey, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. our 64 year democracy is in its infancy stages. We've tried, we've failed a little bit, but we're failing forward. Mm -hmm. And in comparison to, you know, two, three, 400 years, we're still here. Right. So what we need to do is grow beyond aid. And in order to do that, we need to formalize the 95% of the businesses mm -hmm. that are operational in Ghana. They need to be formal. And do you feel like that really needs to happen before the diaspora can really... So let me make the connection. Yeah. Businesses that are operating informally, container stores, mm -hmm. right? These businesses are not persistent in moving up the value chain, right? Or the business value chain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Kwame opens up a container store with a bunch of stuff from China. Kwesi sees it and he's like, you know what? I think this man is making money. I'm going to do the same thing. So just a few stores down, you see very similar products. Right. They've invested their life savings in a container full of stuff that's imported mm -hmm. that they're never going to move in enough mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. that's ac actually profitable. Okay. So again, without formalization, without the getting access to the bank account so that you can establish a financial relationship, mm -hmm. such that you can gain that loan, such that you can grow your business beyond its current positioning, you just have a bunch of businesses that are operating at the very fringes of the, the ecosystem, the, the very, very bottom. Mm -hmm. And then the ownership of all the major enterprises are all foreign nationals. Right. Right. And they take their bag of money and they go home at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that we do our analysis and that we launch our impact awards so that we are providing and shining a light on mm -hmm. Ghanaian enterprises that are truly impacting Ghana, period. Okay. That's the basis of our impact awards. Are you employing Ghanaians? Mm -hmm. Do you have Ghanaian middle managers? Mm -hmm. Do you have Ghanaian upper management? 
are your owners dining in? Mm -hmm. Or is this a shell? Because these are the critical transparency understandings that we need to know so that when we go and we spend our dollars or our CDs, we're doing so with businesses that are employing us, mm -hmm. that are recirculating those dollars in our country. That analysis mm -hmm. lets us know well, in 215 types of businesses, we only own a few of them. Right. So that's the connection between the pathways of citizenship and the pathways of formalization. Let's say Ghana takes this structure and Ghana begins to set it up, mm -hmm. right? Ghana begins to put this pathways to formalization in place. Got it. Where and how does a black diaspora like myself, born in Trenton, New Jersey, grew up in Washington, D.C., who's moved to Ghana fit in? So I think what's really... Like how, what where, what, what right. effect do I have on that system? So I think when we understand the private sector, disaggregating it from the business to the industry all the way up to the sector level, we understand where our need is. Okay. Right? So if we have a whole oil and gas and most of the businesses are operating in retail, but we have all of these other aspects of compliance and bulk mm -hmm. storage mm -hmm. and very few enterprises are up. We need to push more operation in that area, right? And that allows Ghana to be more strategic in its recruiting. We already, governments already offer special, special skills visas to recruit subject matter experts to come into the country to build sector, right? Mm -hmm. We're doing a lot with ICT, we see it. Mm -hmm. But if we just switch a little bit and say, okay, well, this is where we are in Ghana. Mm -hmm. This is our baseline. Mm -hmm. These are our educational institutions, mm -hmm. whether it be academic, vocational, high school, extension, continuing education. We need our educational institutions to train to these standards, mm -hmm. to train to these transferable skills right. so that our human resource capital can fill these positions. Mm -hmm. That's the investment that Ghana needs to make. And it's an investment that it has to start with formalization because you can't, again, go outside looking for return. Until you so it's understanding that this is where Ghana is. Mm -hmm. We have all of this human resources in country. Mm -hmm. We know that these are the educational bodies that can right. train. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also now we can bring back mm -hmm. our humans that were once taken away, and collectively we can chart mm -hmm. a path forward for growth. Okay, now look, I wish, we might have to have you on for a part two because <laughs> we've run out of time, but there's one concept okay. that, um, or one term that, I, that I've seen in, your, in, in, in doing my research that I wanted you to talk about, but I need you to do it in like less than six, 60 seconds. Okay. Let's talk Let's about SGI's time. work and talk about <sighs> evolutionary, no. Talk about evolutionary economics and freedom. Is there a way, is there a way for us to just kind of take what you've taught us, okay. right? Yeah. And what you've talked about today in this interview and wrap it up in 60 seconds. Whew. Okay. Evolutionary Challenge. economic <laughs> and freedom. Okay. Let's do it. Because I think in my mind, based on our previous conversations, yeah. I'm able to say, okay, I see how all of this is evolu evolutionary economics. Yes. And how it how how it gets to freedom but i want you to say that for our listening audience and just okay. you know let's let's see what we can do all right so two main things e6 okay. and 6e okay this is sgi so i'm gonna try to wrap all this up really quickly okay so we believe that e6 is our like equation to getting to evolution okay okay so the first e is exposure okay um you need to be exposed exposure is everything um, after exposure is engagement. Okay. If you are engaged, then you are feeling as though you matter. Okay. And that engagement is important because then it informs the next step, which is how are you going to be educated? What educational tools are going to be brought okay. to help you, again, evolve? Exposure, engagement, education. Exactly. Okay. The education that you receive should be relevant, such okay. that it empowers you. It empowers you to apply this knowledge forward. Empowerment. Okay. After you are empowered, you should be employed. Employed um, to do, to act. Employed in an existing career field. Okay. You also must be entrepreneurial. Okay. Okay. It's important to be innovative and creative because it's not possible to make money just on someone else's mission, vision, and bottom line and waiting for them to pay you. Got you. Climate change is real. Yes. It is not possible to just work. You need to have a hustle. Okay. Okay. All six of those E's will get you to evolution. Okay. Okay. The so that's E6. That's E6. Okay. Six E is how do you now make regenerative economics? Because mm -hmm. evolutionary economics is steeped in regeneration. Okay. Regeneration considers all components of the ecosystem. Okay. The problem with capitalism is it does not. It mm. does not consider our matter. Wow. And matter is a physical Say that being. one more time. Capitalism does not consider our matter. 
Ooh. Matter is a physical state of being. This chair is matter. Mm -hmm. It's a bunch of molecules. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't consider our matter. So how do we have evolutionary economics, right? So first, you have to be efficient. Efficient? You have to be effective. Effective. OK. You have to be ethical. Ethical. It's important. Yes. You have to be equitable. Equitable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to be conscious of the environment. And the environment is plants, animals, people, environment. natural, built, and real economy. OK. That's the environment. Okay. So don't get it twisted. It's not just nature. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> right. All of those things have to go into the. Is equation. there one more? Yes, I'm coming. Okay. Ooh. Right. That's what gets you regenerative economics. Okay. Wow. Wow. And all of those things have to be coordinated, because if they're not, then you're back in capitalism. Hmm. Dr. Ashley Milton. <laughs> I was so excited to have you on the show, and I promise you, you did not disappoint. That's why I've been saying we are in class with Dr. Ashley Milton. I want to thank you again. You know what? <laughs> After this interview, I've been talking so much smack about FAMU, <laughs> right? Firebirds, UDC in the house. Shout I out got, HBCUs. Uh, shout out all HBCUs, but I got a lot more respect for FAMU. FAMU, she's representing y'all well. Thank you for coming. College of Love and Charity. Ah. Ah. We want to thank our listening audience for tuning in to another wonderful episode of Diaspora Link. And as we end all of our shows with our ancestral wisdom, I have a wonderful proverb for you for today. You must attend to your business with the vendor in the market and not the noise in the market. Take that with you. Thank you so much. See you next episode. You'll do great things around the world. You'll do great things around the world. Yeah. You'll do great things around the world. You'll do great things around the world. Yeah. Great things.